This conference will now be recorded. All right, there's our electronic friend letting us know it's time to go. And I just wanted to thank everybody who's attending. If you're here live, you'll have the opportunity to ask both uh, Val Ackerman and Molly Marcusamon some questions later on. Um, if you're watching later on the recorded version, you don't get a chance to ask any questions. Um, <laughs> Just wanted to give everybody, before we start, a couple of other uh, virtual programs that we have coming up in case you're interested. On April 14th, which is this Thursday at 2 o'clock, we have Deaf Culture, Deaf Culture in New Jersey, which is part of the celebration of Deaf, Deaf History Month. And the panelists will share some history of Deaf Culture in New Jersey. And on April 26th at 7 p.m., we have a poetry happening. Mercer Poets Read, uh, Chip McCauley from our Hickory Corner branch, will be hosting an evening of poetry. And both of those are available on the same platform. You can sign up by going to our events page if you're interested in those. And you can also check out some of the other virtual programs that we have coming up uh, later on. Uh, we're happy to have with us tonight uh, Val Ackerman, a Hopewell Valley High School graduate who is now the commissioner of the Big East Conference. And also Molly Marcus-Saman, a Princeton University graduate former athletic director at Princeton University and now the commissioner of the Ladies Professional Golf Association. So two locals who've gone on to some great things in athletics. Um, I just wanted to start off a little bit by, if I'm able to do this and share my camera, I have a short, uh, short little, let's see, this is my always, always, uh, wonder if this will happen. So, okay. So if it doesn't work, I'll just read off what I was going to put up as a PowerPoint display. Uh, I'm assuming that my screen is not sharing. It is not currently. All right. But I hear my technical support coming down the stairs. So maybe it, <laughs> it will be able to, uh, oh wait, here we go. Share screen. And then it says, I have to grant access. Yeah. Open some preferences. Uh, maybe we won't bother with this. I'll just read off what I was going to say. All right, I can do that. So, just a little bit of of background that we have for people. Uh, Title IX. This is the 50th year, and in 1972, Title IX of the Education Amendment. And it stated that no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any, any educational program or activity receiving federalist financial assistance. It was historic legis legislation signed into law on June 23, 1972 by President Richard Nixon. And just to show you a little bit about the growth of women's sports in uh, that first year, 1972, according to the National Federation of High School Athletics, there were 294,015 girls participating in high school sports. In two years, that number grew to 1.3 million. And by the end of the 1978 school year, it was two point, just over 2 million. And in 2018, we're at 3.5 million girls who are participating. Um, and this past year, 2000. 21 right here in New Jersey, Colleen McGuire became the first female to lead the New Jersey State Athletic Association. So she's made strides there. Um, it wasn't until 1982 that the NCAA began to crown uh, its own Division I champions in, in basketball. That first year, Louisiana Tech uh, won the championship over Cheney State. And here to talk with us, we have, of course, Val Ackerman, Commissioner of the Big East Conference since June of 2013. Uh, she spent eight years as an executive with the NBA and in 1996 was named the first president of the WNBA. In 2005, she was elected president of USA Basketball for a, a four-year term. And she's one of the few executives in sports who has held leadership positions in both men's and women's at the collegiate, professional, and national team level. As I mentioned earlier, she's a graduate of Hopewell Valley High School right here. Um, in 2001, she was part of the first Hall of Fame class at Hopewell Valley High School, where she earned nine varsity letters, four in basketball, three in field hockey, two in track and field. And 
I believe, Val, I think I checked this with the current athletic director, your 1,466 points are still the most at Hopewell Valley High School. Go, Val. No one's, no one's beating without, your record. Yet. Without a three-point line. Without a three-point line, Bob. That is That's true. That's right. Three, pre three-point line. Um, in 1999, she was elected to the NJSI Hall of Fame. And if I'm correct, yesterday you were inducted into the Mercer County Basketball Hall of Fame. Is that correct? That's correct. Was that just yesterday? So good. It's so it's it's been a, a very long and successful run with a lot of accomplishments for Val. Uh, Molly is currently the commissioner of the LPGA, She's the former director of athletics at Princeton University from 2014 to 2021. Uh, this year, Princeton is celebrating 50 years of women's athletics. Um, at Princeton, she earned four varsity letters in both soccer and ice hockey, and she was named first team all Ivy in ice hockey all four years that she was there. Uh, she was named to the collegiate women's ice hockey team of the decade for the 1990s. And as a senior at Princeton was awarded the C. Otto von Kindbush Sportswoman of the Year Award, which honored the university's top female athlete who also displayed high scholastic rank and sportsmanship. So great accomplishments for the for both of you. And, and once again, we thank you both for being here. And, and one of the things I, I wanted to start off by asking was if you could reflect a little bit about what high school sports and what sports were like for you as a, when you were growing up as opposed, you know, now everybody knows what it's like, but what was it like for you guys as you were just getting started in sports? You want to take oh. that first Val? Cause, cause I think Bobby forgot to also say what a stud Val was in college, but she, she can, she can talk about that too. Well, th yeah, Molly, why don't I, why don't I, I'll lead here and uh, look forward to your sort of reflections as well. But, um, you know, as, as Bob noted, I am about as local as it gets here. I uh, grew up in Pennington, um, went to Timberlane. I went to Pennington Grammar, um, went to uh, Tollgate School and then Timberlane and then, of course, Hopewell Valley. And but Bob, as I was for sort of thinking about, you know, your your preface here, Title IX was passed when I was in seventh grade. So that was June of 72. So I was um, had just finished seventh grade at Timberlane was about to go into eighth grade, and here's a memory. There were no girl sports teams at Timberlane when I was there, not a one. The only one, actually, I take it back, the only one was cheerleading. That was it. And um, I was sort of lucky because I had grown up swimming at Penbrook, was on the swim team there for many years, and I think there might have been a rec league of some sort um, early on, but it wasn't much. But I... Um, I didn't get to play on sports when I was on Timberlane. Tried out for cheerleading and actually didn't make the team. It was one of the, uh, it was actually a bit of a trauma for me not to have made it. <laughs> um, but, um, but that was then. And then I went on to the high school. Um, I, folks may know this. Uh, my dad, Randy Ackerman, was the AD at the high school, which was very neat to have your dad, you know, with an office on site. So between classes, you could pop in. And I'll say with, you know, I lost my dad many years ago, but I'll say with pride, he was a founding father of the Colonial Valley Conference when it came into being in the mid seventies. And um, I think because of me, I know because of me, had a particular interest in girl sports. And so was very much part of supporting um, the basketball team, the field hockey team. I was coached by the great Barb Skiba. Um, I, I was on the track team, as you mentioned, when Walt Crickling was the coach. and um, it was, you know, as a high school kid, you don't notice things like an adult would. Uh, you have too many other distractions in your life. But it, but I do remember vividly being part of girls sports at Hopewell Valley and in Mercer County. And it was, it was nice to see that it was, even though there weren't many types of girls sports there, it was taken seriously. It was taken seriously. So whether that was field hockey, cross country, um, I was a, I was a year behind the great Hillary Noden, who was the great runner, who went on to run at Penn State. She was, you know, a New Jersey State high school champion in distance running. We talked her into playing on the basketball team my junior year, her senior year, and we made it all the way that year to the Group Two um, state semifinals. We lost to St. Rose of Belmar. It was another great trauma in my life, um, losing to St. Rose. They were really good. 
Um, but but girl sports meant something even then. Was it like it is today? Not at all. You know, not at all. And the high school team school scene at that point was without soccer and without lacrosse and without volleyball. And I think Molly, we were up without ice hockey back then. Swimming came later. We just had the basics, if you will. Um, but I did feel like I was part of something that people thought was important. And certainly having my dad in the AD chair helped a lot. Um, and now when I look back and see how, how far girls sports have come, and I've had the honor, you mentioned Colleen McGuire, of meeting Colleen, getting to know her a little bit, and um, I'm thrilled um, for her appointment and know she's going to uh, bring girls sports in, uh, in the state of New Jersey even further than they are now. Um, it's exciting to see. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and for me, I mean, Val, Val has been, um, you know, just a leader in the field of sports, not just women's sports, but but sports in general. So it's fun to be here with you today, Val, and to have our connection from the first time we met, the, the Princeton and sort of Mercer County connection is a fun a fun connection. Um, you know, I too grew up in a, in a college town, but a, a different college town. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. And so I think that's a real advantage, you know, being being around a university when you when you grow up because you have these role models that you can, you know, you, you can aspire to be like. And so, you know, I grew up in Ithaca. I, my family was not a big sports family that wasn't, you know, we, my parents certainly encouraged us. But having the university right there, I had the opportunity to see men and women. I was a little bit younger. I'm a little bit younger than Val. I, I grew up in the sort of mid to, to late 70s, early 80s, graduated from high school in 87. And, um, but as a as a kid, I think you know Title IX and just sports, everything about sports has been the most important part of my life. So um, you know sometimes you don't even know the impact, particularly as a kid, you don't know the impact of something like Title IX. But I think I was just slightly after um, you know that that initial period where I didn't even really know it was a thing, which I think is a good thing. I think I learned much more about the impact of Title IX and the importance of Title IX later in my time. But I just grew up, woke up every day wanting to play sports. And, um, you know, I do have very vivid memories of going home to my mother and getting a flyer in second grade and from the Cornell coach, as a matter of fact, who sent it around to the elementary school saying, we really want to get kids in, into hockey. I think he intended boys, but... I didn't see the difference. And so I went home to my mother and said, listen, I, I want to play ice hockey. And I'd already started playing softball and baseball and soccer and various other sports. And, you know, the first thing that she said, who, you know, obviously my mother has been an unbelievable support to me on my whole life. But she said, listen, girls don't play ice hockey. You're not playing ice hockey. How about swimming? How about, you know, anything else, dance? And I just said, I'm, I'm playing ice hockey. I saw the women at Cornell play. I've seen the men play all, all the time and I, I wanna play ice hockey and I love the equipment and everything about it. And so she, I begged and begged and she, she let me play. So again, sports were everything in, in my childhood are all about, I think it's not just about the competition and about the fun and the health and fitness. It's obviously about the education, the identity that you develop as an athlete, the confidence that you develop as an athlete. Um, and I had the the pleasure to, and the, and the great fortune, I think, to be in a town like this, this town, like Hopewell and Mercer County that really did value women's sports at an early age. I went to all the Cornell soccer games, all the Cornell hockey games, all the Cornell basketball games that I could possibly go to. We had Ithaca College there as well that had some phenomenal women's sports teams. So for me, sports is much has been much more than just a, uh, something that I enjoy doing. It's been, a, it's been a passion. It's been obviously my career my whole life just because I just really believe in the value of it as an educational opportunity and really a, a great equalizer in society. So again, uh, lots of hurdles. I do remember the football coach coming over to my parents' house and sitting at the a little sort of small fry football and I played only with boys and just um, again woke up every day thinking about how I could get on some type of field hit some type of ball um, and the football coach decided that I might be a good running back for the small fry football team and I think that was a bridge too far for my mother she was like you can play hockey but you're not playing football so but I do remember uh, Mr. Nemo sitting around the, the dinner table trying to convince my parents to let me play running back for his football team so um, great memories, and again, obviously, has been the biggest impact in, in my career as well. Um, my passion for sports and the role it can play in society. And Molly, you mentioned it, and I, and I was thinking probably Val ran into the same 
situation. When you were younger, you probably had to play a lot of sports with the boys because they didn't they didn't offer the opportunity just for a, a girls, like you said, girls ice hockey. You probably grew up playing with the boys, Val. You probably had to start playing basketball maybe with the boys. I mean, that's something nowadays where nobody thinks twice that there's going to be a girls team, there's going to be a boys team, but it hasn't always been that way. Yeah, I mean, I'll say one thing about, about um, Ithaca. Again, we had a girls ice hockey team and I played on the same team from the time I was 11 through graduating from high school. But I, I, I it was so different then that at, at age 11, you started checking um, in, in hockey and, and then you, some of the teams were travel teams. And I remember wanting to play, continue to play on the boys team, but I had to stay in the house league because at that time they wouldn't let girls play on the travel team because of the locker room situation, which is so bizarre because you don't even, you know, at age 11 or 12, you don't necessarily even have to go in a locker room. And um, you certainly can still play checking at that point, but it was very clear that at that, when you turned 11 or 12, you would move over to playing with the girls. And fortunately, Ithaca at a very kind of, you know, much earlier than many towns had, had a girls hockey program. But there were really clear distinctions of like, okay, when you get to this point, you move to the to the girls, um, which is not the case anymore. Hey, Bob, and I'll I'll add here, um, you know, that uh, being a few years ahead of Molly, there were no girls sports teams before I got to Hopel Valley. I mean, as I mentioned, there was nothing at Timberlane, um, and so you know, it was really neighborhood stuff that um, sort of whetted your appetite here. I mean, I played, we had, I lived on Hale Street. Um, we, you know, we moved to Birch Street behind the Pennington Grammar School when I was in 10th grade, but I, I grew up on Hale Street uh, just off of Welling Avenue. And we had a, my dad set up a basket in the driveway and that was how we played with kids in the neighborhood. I remember playing um, softball and baseball. Oh, it's now called the Senior Center. It used to be the old Scout House. Uh, around the corner and we just would play, you know, games with, you know, boys in the neighborhood. And that was really what you did. Molly, this is sort of, I, um, we, we used to uh, skate uh, behind the, the Pennington Prep School. There used to be a pond. It was known as the Prep School Pond. Mm. I don't know if it's there anymore, but that was, we would just take our skates. We'd, uh, we'd run down there when, when it froze over. And it was some combination of, figure twirling, figure skating type twirls, and then sort of pick up hockey games on the prep school pond. It was like totally unsupervised. So if the ice was cracked, it was just left to us little kids to figure out whether it was safe or not to go out there. So, you know, times have changed, obviously, in terms of adult supervision on that sort of thing. But it was just part of growing up in Pennington for me was just, you know, playing sports with friends and you know, co-ed all the way. And again, it wasn't until I got to high school that I really, you know, came to to know and appreciate what it meant to be on a girls-only team. Absolutely. I have a feeling you were playing hockey and not maybe doing too many twirls, but uh, well, you know, you watch the Olympics. I mean, that's how we yeah. that's how we found role models, right? We watched TV, and so it was the Winter Games and the figure skaters. There weren't any women playing ice hockey, as you know, back then um, on TV, and it was the Summer Games. And it was women's tennis. I mean, that was the big thing was, you know, when, you know, when Billie Jean King, uh, who we both know, have come to know, is one of the great leaders in women's sports. I mean, she started doing her thing in the early 70s in women's tennis, and that really set the stage for the other sports that followed. Yeah, and the LPGA, too. I mean, that was part of uh, my interest in this job as well. I mean, the LPGA, we've been around for 71 years, which is quite remarkable. Similar story to the WTA in terms of the, the passion of the, the founding members, just a few women who decided they weren't going to take no for an answer and they were going to push through some barriers and, and create something that most people thought was not possible. And so as a young girl, you know, those were the role models I had as well. You got to see women playing the Olympics, like you said, playing tennis and and playing golf. And we just um, had a, a, a large, uh, our major championship that used to be called the Nabisco Championship and then the ANA and the Dinosaur. And we just had that last week out in um, Palm Springs and set the celebration of, of so many tremendous years of, of history. It was really fun to think back and to see what the purse levels were then compared to what they are now and how much uh, money women made playing golf you know, 50 years ago versus versus now. So 
um, quite a bit of progress, but those were the role models. And they always say, you know, if, if you can see it, you can be it, but if you can't see it, it's, it's hard to be it. So we were really fortunate to have a, a few sports to be ro to have role models now with all the media. And I mean, obviously that's a, still an area that we need to improve significantly uh, the, the television exposure and the opportunities, um, you know, on more broad network television and, and other sources. But um, we have the girls, young girls have many more role models to aspire to now. And I was thinking too, as you were you were both talking, it wasn't that there was a lack of interest in sports for the girls. There just, there just wasn't the opportunity because obviously you were both grew up loving sports, wanting to participate in sports, but you just didn't have the opportunity that was there for the boys. But you kind of carved your own opportunity, right? You guys both both kind of made your own path and made sure you weren't going to be denied. I know Val, you said there were no sports at Timberlane. But you still managed to continue with sports, and then thankfully, you know, by the time you got to high school, there were options there. Yeah, I think that's right, Bob. I mean, um, you know, you had to find your own outlets there. They weren't as readily available. I mean, I have two daughters. They're um, 29 and 27. They were um, mostly raised in New York City, but we would spend a lot of time in Mercer County or Hunterton County when they were growing up to be near my, my family, my husband's family. And so it was, it was good to see there were soccer leagues during the weekends. And as Molly mentioned, there's now ice hockey leagues, there's softball leagues, there's a lot of offerings now. So it's much easier for parents and kids alike to, um, to try things. I think that's really important when you're, you know, when you're bringing up kids to try to expose them to as many sports as possible. Um, my, my husband, Molly's an avid golfer. We were members of Hopewell Valley Golf Club for many years. Um, I, I used to actually hit balls. It used to be called Madiri's Golf Range. For anybody listening, it's on 31. I don't know what the name of it is now, but I think it's still there, Bob. That it's still there. South of the Pennington <laughs> Calling yeah. Market. I've hit many a bucket of balls out of that place. Um, my brother actually used to drive the cart that was in the field that would pick up the balls and uh, and bring them back to the uh, tees. But, you know, it, I would say our area is really kind of a treasure trove of offerings, um, but you had to be um, kind of, um, you know, resourceful when uh, when you were a young girl growing up in the late 60s to, you know, to, fun to find out where you could go to get your fix. And Molly, you kind of alluded to it too before. I mean, it's been 50 years now and there's been great progress, but there's still a long way to go to get to get even to a better level than we are now. I mean, we have professional leagues, which is great. There's so many more opportunities, but it seems like when you think about the fact that it's been 50 years, maybe we should have had a little bit more progress made by this point than what we have. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think you can always look at sports as a, you know, sort of a, a, a microcosm of the of society. And sometimes women's sports is trailing behind some of the other um, sort of, uh, I guess, equity um, that, that women have had or opportunities that, that women are given. Um, and, and that's a really interesting uh, kind of conversation. Why is that the case? Um, you know, for example, in, in a, a pay equity conversation, right now in women's professional sports, there is a significant divide between what women uh, professional athletes may, make in various sports versus their male counterparts. And if you really think about that in corporate America, there's still a pay equity issue, but it's not nearly as significant. I say that sometimes to some of our top CEOs who are supporting us at a very high level and are committed to women's sports and just in kind of conversation saying, can you imagine if you know, at your company, and these are very progressive leaders, you know, sort of at your company that the women who have a the best in the world who work for you would make, you know, 10% of what the best in the world males would make um, at the same company. And it's just really interesting to think about why that's the case. And look historically throughout society, throughout the time that women started playing sports and where that's grown. And obviously the progress has been great, but at the LPGA, you know, at the, at the highest level, just from a particular earnings on the tour, uh, the divide is, is pretty significant, but it gets even bigger as you go down the leaderboard. So our 144th best player in the world, so this is the 144th best female golfer in the world because we're a global tour, 
she might make somewhere around $70,000 in prize money. Um, she obviously might make some endorsements and some have other opportunities for, for income. The 150th best male player on the PGA Tour, I think made last year a million 69. So a, a million dollars more. Um, our having said that though, at the top of our leaderboard, the very best, the number one player in the world made $3.5 million in just prize money last year and probably double that or more than double that in endorsements. The second best player made 2.5 and I think we had 15 players make over a million dollars. And again, just in, in, in earnings. So that's huge progress from back in the 70s and 80s where you know they may make a couple thousand dollars when they won a tournament. Um, and the, the, the prize money for the entire season is less, far less than some individual tournaments that we're sponsoring now. So great progress has been made, but there is a significant uh, room for growth and um, there's a significant room for growth in the amount of corporate dollars put into women's sports I think we're growing and people are seeing the value because of the talent of the women and again that's a result of title nine it takes it takes time but the talent levels are so significant at this point of our female athletes and we we need to get the corporate dollars to catch up to that I think we're probably less than I know we're less than 10 percent of all corporate dollars goes to women's professional sports at this point um, and similar single digit numbers for media exposure and television exposure so huge room for growth but um, you know a tremendous amount has happened over over the past uh, 50 years and, and before and now being as you are as with the Big East Conference, uh, very successful both men's athletics and women's athletics. Uh, we had talked before we started about how the conference put a team in each final four, which was great for the conference, made you a little jet lag probably going back and forth. <laughs> but um, there's opportunities there for at the college level. I think it's a little bit closer than it is at the professional level as as Molly was talking about, right? College, it seems like there's a little bit less of a divide than there was in the past. Uh, well, there, there's no question about that, Bob. Um, I mean, Title IX applies directly to um, institutions of higher learning that are receiving federal, federal funding and do, does not apply to pro leagues. Um, so that's, you know, that's the long-term challenge there is, you know, how do you, how do you find owners who are willing to provide capitalization? How strong is the product in the marketplace? How much fan support is there? And, uh, you know, I want to laud the LPGA because they've been proving for many, many decades that there is support for golf, women's golf at the highest levels. And I know under Molly's leadership, um, we'll, we'll continue to grow. Um, you know, I, you mentioned that I spent um, many years of my career in pro basketball. I spent 16 years at the NBA, the first eight of which I worked on the men's side, and then the last eight of which I served as the uh, first president of the WNBA. And I, you know, I will attest there is a is a pretty wide disparity still, 25 years later, on the salaries um, that that women's pro basketball players make compared to their male counterparts. I mean, the NBA salaries, frankly, are they're extraordinary. Um, they've been driven by the growth in media revenue, most of all, but also when you throw into the pot ticket sales, sponsorship sales, merchandising monies, um, and other revenue sources, um, it, it adds up. And um, the players in pro basketball have been good bargainers at the uh, at the bargaining table and have gotten their, you know, a very healthy share of those revenues. Um, you know, WNBA salaries have grown since the first year we launched the league. I, I'm not, you know, since I'm not there anymore, I can't speak with authority on what those numbers are. They're better, but they're, again, nowhere near what men's pro basketball players are making. So that's going to be, um, you know, an area for growth for sure. At the collegiate level, it is closer, as you said. There, there are still, um, unfortunately, some inequities. We saw that um, unfortunately, unfolding last year when reports widely publicized in social media revealed the inequities between the men's and the women's college basketball tournaments. Um, and I, you know, I think in the last year, the folks running those tournaments have come a long way in terms of addressing the principal concerns there. So I guess, you know, to answer your question, it, it is better because Title IX applies for the most part. Um, but, you know, but, um, but there's no question that there's room for improvement 
Um, you know, one thing I'll, I'll just note here, Bob, when I think about Title IX and, and, and Molly spoke about sort of all the areas that it's helped, just for the, you know, audience here, you know, I've come to think about how Title IX has affected women's sports in four sort of separate categories. The first is participation. More girls and women play sports than they did 50 years ago. Um, and so that's, you know, that progress is real. Number two, I think about women as consumer. Uh, more women than there used to be support sports as fans. They're coming to games, they're watching on television, they're in the galleries of, you know, women's golf events and tennis tournaments and basketball games and soccer games. And that wasn't so 50 or 175 years ago. So companies large and small are recognizing the importance of women as, as, as spenders, which is supporting the growth of these outlets. Number three, I think about the growth at the collegiate level, which you talked about, and at the elite platforms like pro leagues and at the Olympic level. Women are now 50% of Team USA. That wasn't always so. Have so many women representing their country in sports like the Olympics and other world national team competition. And then last but not least, I think about um, how we've seen a shift in the number of women who are leading and serving as key decision makers in sports organizations. And, you know, Molly is case in point here, a woman leading uh, a major global sports organization. And I had that opportunity with the WNBA and I have it now as commissioner of the Big East Conference. That wasn't the case. 50 years ago, women were working in sports. They were probably coaches. Um, and now we see them as coaches, as administrators, or working for leagues, or working for networks, or working for brands, or working for national governing bodies. Um, and so, you know, are there enough of us? Probably not. There's fewer women leading than there are men leading and making decisions, but it's better than it used to be. And I'm going to be the optimist here. I think as more women play sports, they have a connection because of their number one bucket that I gave you, participation. I think the prospects for women to continue to take a more assertive um, and and uh, and you know and and uh, and forceful role in managing sports in our country will will only grow. Yeah, and I'll say from an from an optimism standpoint, I think um, you know traditionally sponsorships are driven by the eyeballs and there used to be just a few mechanisms to get eyeballs but now with social media and various other forms of media there there is a a, a a larger opportunity for women athletes to be known and to to be branded and for people to um to support in that way and i i think also corporations are sort of stepping back and particularly with some of the reckoning around what, what Val mentioned with the, with the um, final four last year or the March Madness, women, the, the women's uh, NCAA basketball tournament, sort of putting people using social media to show some of those inequities and, and then really pushing people towards change and people sort of standing up and go, wait a minute, like, why, why is this the case? And, and I was the AD at that time at Princeton. And why have we you know, allowed ourselves to focus on men's sports more than we have women's sports, particularly at the college level when it's really about education. You know, it's about at Princeton, we always say, you know, education through athletics is the is the mantra. And that's really what our goal is and what our mission is, is to, to use athletics as a platform to to build leaders and to build community and um, to change people's lives and to, to set them up for future success. And so why why just fundamentally have we thought of men's sports as sports and then women's sports as sort of the other. And I think all of that is really mindsets are changing and for great leadership like Val's at the at the college level and, and many others. So I think that there's great optimism there. And then I also think, you know, corporate America is sort of saying, wait, wait a minute, we, you know, we believe in women's empowerment. We believe, believe in women's leadership. We believe in diversity. Why does our sponsorship portfolio look like it does? You know, why why are we spending 90, 95, 98 percent of our corporate dollars on men's sports when we actually can get tremendous engagement? Because as Val said, there's so many female consumers. People love watching women's sports if it's on. You know, I think of the basketball tournament this past weekend, Val, what was it, 18,000 fans at the game? Um, you know, our, our sport, the LPGA has shown that if you have it on TV, people watch it. If you put it out there in a good tournament, people come um, and people really get behind the athletes. So this is a little bit of mindset. And in, in, in my thought, you know, people are really starting to rethink this a little bit. 
there's never been more interest in the LPGA right now. And I know from my colleagues around the professional sports world and at the college level, there's never been more corporate interest in women's sports because I think they're seeing it both as, you know, the, the right thing to do, which is great, but also seeing it as a great business opportunity. It's an opportunity to speak to your employees about what you really care about. There's so much work around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, so much work about around trying to find the next female leaders, trying to, because they, because people truly believe it, it is the truth that a diverse workforce and a diverse leadership group will uh, produce better results. And so a lot of our top sponsors, and these are some of the biggest brands in the world, are stepping up and saying, you know, this is an opportunity and a platform to tell our employees that we really do care about what we talk about every day and to talk about their values within that space. And so all of the things we've talked about today has, has created this, I think, res res amazing, I guess, surge in, in women's sports. We sort of say, it, we feel like it's our time. There's been these moments in women's sports history. And I think all of us in the industry feel like we're in another one of those big moments for, for change for all of those reasons that Val touched on and I've touched on a little bit here. So I think there's great optimism, still a ways to go, but I, I really do believe that we're gonna hit that next big level of growth for women's sports um, now. I wanted to invite anyone who's watching, if they have a question, they can throw it into the chat and, and I'll be happy to pass it on. Um, the other thing you guys both talked a little bit about too, I was thinking we just had the Olympics. And to me, when I watch the Olympics, I'm as interested or probably more interested in the women's sports than I am in the men's sports. And that's an area where I feel like we really had a lot of improvement. Like, um, you know, I, well, part of it was we had some local people, Kelly Curtis from Princeton was in the Olympics. Um, but that's, a, that's an area too, where I think we've seen a lot of growth over the last several years. Well, there, there's a question there, Bob. I don't have the data handy, but as I mentioned earlier, the percentage of women representing um, not only Team USA, but national teams uh, around the world has, has grown progressively over the last several decades. Um, you know, we're seeing more sports added to the Olympic program. Um, and in many of those, women athletes are shining. I mean, I, I like you, was mesmerized by some of the competitions. Um, that I saw at the, uh, the Winter Games this year. I mean, some of the acrobatics that some of these men and women alike um, were doing in half pipe and some of these other sports was sort of, you know, incredible. Um, and as as Molly noted, um, there is a great interest among corporate America in corporate America for you know fresh faces, new role models, uh, people who they think can relate to their consumers. And so. Uh, it's not surprising when you hear that a successful Olympian has begun to cash out um, from an endorsement standpoint after a, a high visibility outing like they have uh, with the games. Um, yeah, and I think that, sorry about Val, I think that goes back to what you were saying before. What we were saying is that, you know, if you if they get the media exposure, it's not for a lack of interest in the women. It's not for a lack of talent. It's just traditionally they haven't been on TV. And if you, you it's hard to follow a role model that you don't see. And so with the Olympics, you know, there was quite a bit of, um, you know, great, great coverage in the Summer Olympics as well as the Winter Olympics. And I think the female athletes were the most um, sought after and there was most engagement around three of the top athletes in the Summer Olympics, I think, were females last year that in terms of engagement and, and uh, the support on media. So that's pretty amazing. Hey, one, one point I would make, Bob and Molly, both is, um, you know, sort of how Title IX has fueled that. And how, as I look around at other countries who are not as far along as we are, particularly on the leadership piece, uh, I find myself saying if there was a Title IX for the world, we might see the kind of progress globally. Molly, I think you, you, know, you, you get a bird's eye view of this with your work in golf. But I'll, you know, I'll give an example. I spent um, eight years as the U.S. representative to the International Basketball Federation. It was, frankly, you know, I wasn't out on the field of play representing my country, but it's pretty cool to be sitting at a table uh, with your name and a little American flag next to it, representing the USA point of view um, in an important sports organization. And that was my role with, with basketball. And I have to tell you, there were not many women um, that were um, it, you know, involved in leader and decision-making positions that I saw globally. And I found this you know, to be an area, frankly, of great defeat. I was a, a pretty forceful advocate for this, but when you're dealing with patriarchal countries in many corners of the world, it is hard 
um, to, you know, to make the case that we, we make so easily here. It's just, right. It's just, of course, you know, it, it, women need to play sports. And of course, girls need to have that, as Molly said, as part of their education. And of course, because of that connection to sports, they're going to go on and do important things with their lives because of that educational experience and the life skills they've gotten. It, it, that's not how, you know, people in other parts of the world always look at things. So I think if there was a to-do in my mind, it would be to, to grow the number of women who are uh, working and, and leading elsewhere. I'm actually part of a very cool State Department program called the Global Sports Mentoring Program, where women executives from other countries come to the U.S. and spend time here and get the experience of seeing how we do it in the USA, how we lead, what we do, how sports work here. And then, you know, they go back and bring that, you know, back to their home countries and hopefully move the ball forward um, in terms of what they can do there. Um, and so, you know, I'm a believer in that and, and sort of paying it forward and not just here in the USA, but, but globally. But if there is an area where I'd love to see some improvement, I'm uh, curious to get your thoughts on this too, Molly. Um, it, you know, it would be helping our, you know, our sisters in other countries um, as they look to uh, to make more of an impact um, in, you know, in the societies that they call home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing I've been, um, you know, really surprised by, not not so, I wouldn't say 100% surprised just because I've been a, a fan of the LPGA for a long time, but, you know, diving into the business side of things, um, in Korea, the LPGA actually has um, demands a much higher media right value than the than the PGA Tour, which is probably the only place in the world. But the LPGA players in Korea are more popular than the the male golfers in Korea by a significant margin, and which is really fun to see. It's like the only place where kind of that. Um, uh, our ability to drive revenues uh, surpasses the men's ability to drive revenues in those markets, which just to me shows that it's not because women's sports isn't interesting or that people aren't interested. It's just a, a little bit of a mindset shift or or the commitment, I think, and I ask that question all the time, you know, why are the Korean golfers so good and what has the uh, Korean culture done or society done or government or sporting agencies done to to create this dynamic because it's pretty unusual there. Um, as I said, you know, our number one golfer is Korean right now, Jin Young-ko. She's one of the most remarkable athletes I've ever seen. I mean, her consistency, her her talent, the winning that she's done on the tour. But she so she made three and a half million dollars last year, but she also did tremendously well on her endorsements, both in the Korean market, but also around the world. So it's just interesting that if we all take a step back and say, well, what are the core components? Some of it is mindset. Some of it is um, mostly exposure too. And, and how do we, we show the world the, the great talent? And I think some people say, why has it taken so long? If you really think about the participation rates that you've talked about, but the level of play, I, you know, I look back, coming back to Princeton as the, the AD, I would have struggled to Bob, you read some nice accolades that I had in, in college. I would have struggled to make the Princeton team now. I mean, to be on the team, let alone, um, you know, be one of the better players. They're just the level of play in all sports is so significant because of the opportunities young girls have been given and because of the way society has uh, valued it, particularly in the U.S., you know, valued girls' participation in sports. And so all of that has lent itself to, you know, a, a much bigger uh, part of the pie that we can take. So, but it's taken a long time because that mindset has needed to change, those opportunities have needed to change. One of the questions that we have in the in the chat is what advice would you give to uh, young female athletes today as they start to get involved with sports? Molly, I'll let you. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, listen, I, I, I think there are so many, as we've talked about, there are so many more opportunities, whether whether you have the talent to um, you know, be a be a great athlete. I think people's one of the things I really noticed at these different junctures in time is 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 how young girls identify and and sort of their own personal identity. I think even when I was growing up, and Val, probably when you were growing up. You know, you, you, I think I identified as an athlete from a very young age, but that was relatively unusual. I think when I got to Princeton, a lot of the athletes really loved playing and they were committed to it. And, you know, they had spent a lot of time growing up playing, but it, something in the mid 90s shifted where I think girls just started really seeing themselves as competitive, strong athletes who identified that was a big part of their identity. 
and that's just grown and grown and grown and the talent level has just continued to grow so so whether you have that talent and that inclination there are opportunities everywhere and you know dive in and focus on your own performance behaviors the both the physiological and the psychological that kind of lead to your own peak performance but i think the other thing that val talked about before is so critical there are so many avenues in sports, you know, whether you want to be in administration or in coaching, um, if you're not, if you don't have the talent to play or the desire to play. So I think that so much comes from it. I would say everything good in my life that, you know, that has come, including my my family and meeting my husband and all those things really have come through sports. So I, you never discount those things from a young age, the, the people that I've met, the opportunities that I've had because of sports, um, the skills that I've learned. So I think it's critical for all young girls, women, boys too, to get into sports. It's just too much of a an important part of society. It's like education. And that's why I think it's our responsibility to continue to make sure that we give those opportunities, not only to young girls, but also to communities, under-resourced communities, people who might not feel welcome in various sports, I, I think that is our responsibility. I know at the LPGA, that's how we look at it. That sports are too valuable to people's lives to, to not um, be very intentional with how we give the game to, to others, mostly for the educational value. So I say get involved, you know, dive in, make it part of your identity if you love it, and then find various avenues to continue to have it be part of your life. Hey, Bob, the two, I would add two quick ones. One is um, maybe this is directed to the parents. Um, as much as the kids, but, um, you know, I didn't specialize, uh, you know, um, you, that, that wasn't sort of done when I was coming up. I mean, I had a chance to play different sports. So I had, you know, field hockey in the fall and I played basketball in the winter and I ran track in the spring and I was able to swim in the summer. And I, you know, did a lot of, you know, I, I was, a, you know, kind of ran on the side and played a little bit of tennis. And as I said, hit, you know, buckets of golf balls. So I don't know, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a parent of a young kid today. So I, I, I can't, I don't know what the pressures are to specialize, but I think if you can do sort of a cross section of sports for as long as you can, I think you're better for it. And, and again, I don't know if that's a message for the kids or the parents directly. And then number two, um, and this was my situation with my kids, even if you're not the star of the team and you sort of, you know, find yourself sort of pressured out of a sport because the other girls are better than you and they're the stars. And so you feel intimidated. I just hope that any girl who starts sports doesn't end sports. Um, you know, sport, we, you know, as, as women, we have to make sports part of our daily lives. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we need it for our health. Um, we, you know, we need it for our mental well-being to play, you know, even if it's taking a walk or a jog. You don't have to be the best player on the team in order to get enjoyment out of a physical activity. And I think sometimes that message gets lost on young women um, when they drop out. You know, many do. Um, they, you know, they they tend to drop out altogether. And I just would encourage um, any young girl who any of our viewers, um, you know, have as a daughter or have in your lives, just to encourage them to keep up with their physical well-being because. Yeah. When you're, especially when you get a job and you, you know, you're trying to do it all. If you don't have those outlets later on in your life to blow off a little bit of steam and keep your heart, you know, you know, going, going strong, um, you're, you're not doing yourselves or the people that work for you or your family members. Um, you're doing them a disservice. Yeah, Val, those are great points. And again, I do have kids at that at that age, and it, the, tr the the pressure to to specialize is so significant they i always say we've sort of ruined youth sports i, I you know it, my son wants to play every sport and i want him to play every sport my, my daughters all played a, a ton of sports and are still doing so but it's made it almost impossible on a family if it because the travel's so significant the commitment's so significant the finances are so significant so but i still have really pushed as hard as possible to keep my kids playing the things that they want to play and secondarily from a mental health perspective you know just constantly saying to my kids you, you, this is not a job. You playing sports is not a job. The minute it becomes a job, you have to to, to reflect on that and decide you're going to have a different mindset. This is supposed to be both educational and fun. And so again, if you're not the best player, if you're not playing every minute, 
I, I hope they don't quit also, but I also hope they see that there's huge leadership opportunities from that, from that adversity. And so it's a constant conversation at our dinner table is, listen, this is, this is not a job. You do not play sports. You do not make money playing sports. This is not something you must do. It's supposed to be fun. First of all, you're supposed to love it. You're supposed to get a great physical benefits from it, but you're also supposed to, to learn from it. Um, and so, you know, keep with it and keep at it and keep having fun with it because the minute parents make it a job for kids is the minute they get burnt out and the minute they specialize is the minute they get hurt particularly young women i mean that's been documented the acl and injuries and issues so couldn't agree with you more about before we wrap up the one other thing i wanted to to ask you you both were very successful athletes yourself and now you you're both groundbreaking in in terms of the roles that you have Molly, first athletic direct, female athletic director at Princeton. Val, you've been the first all over the place f female. W when did you kind of know that you wanted to make that transition and, and stay in sports and, and continue to be leaders in women's sports? I guess, Val, you can go first and then maybe sure, Molly. Yeah. So, Bob, um, it, it, you know, it hit me in law school. I, um, I went to UVA. Uh, I was able to go on a basketball scholarship following my time at Hopewell Valley. Um, I played for the great Debbie Ryan, another Hopo Valley alum. Um, and, you know, my dream really when I went to college was I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know much about the profession. My dad was, you know, in sports. My mom worked for the state of New Jersey. I didn't have any family members, but it just it just seemed like very interesting. Watch, you know, lawyers on television and uh, and got inspired. And so that's what I did. I um, after I got out of UVA, I. Um, I played basketball briefly overseas because I had that chance, and then I went on to law school. And it was really in law school that I sort of said, you know, what am, I, I need to combine <laughs> the law with with sports, and that eventually uh, led me to my first job. Not right away. Uh, I wasn't able to get a sports law job out of law school. That took a little while, um, but that's where it really all came together for me. Um, I, you know, I was on Wall Street actually for a couple of years, and that's when it occurred to me that that was not going to be my, you know, my calling, um, that it really was going to be back in the sports world. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get get in with the NBA in the uh, late 80s when their business was just starting to take off. David Stern, the longtime commissioner, was in his fourth year and, uh, you know, had a, you know, a real command of uh, future trends. And that included the WNBA. You know, for David, it was not a matter of if, but when there would someday be a women's NBA. And, uh, I, you know, I was in a position to be on the ground floor of all of that, which was incredibly exciting. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm also less, I'll just say I'm a big proponent, by the way, of the grad degree. <laughs> so I think if there's any young women on this call and, you know, you have a chance to continue your education after college, get a professional degree, a law degree, whatever it is. Uh, I'm just a huge proponent of continuing your education for as long as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you know, I think I mentioned before, I think from the minute I I knew what sports were, the minute I, I started playing, it was sort of in my blood and that is how I identified as a as an athlete. It was the thing I was probably best at, but it, it, it gave me confidence to be good at other things too. And that's another one of those huge benefits of sports. But so, you know, when I was in college, I, I, I just was like, I, I was dreading the moment that sports would end at a competitive level. And as we've talked about, those same kind of professional opportunities didn't exist in, in ice hockey and in soccer. Really, there was the national team, which is very, very hard to, to make in soccer. And in ice hockey, the national team was just starting to form. I think that I graduated in 91 and the first Olympic team was in 98. That was a long time to put a career on hold and you know, pr probably was on the cusp of that, but but really wanted to get to my career. But my, my my college roommates and I all sat around and said, you know, we had to write it on a piece of paper because we didn't have email or computers or anything, but we were saying, well, what, what would you like to be doing? Or what do you think you'll be doing in five years? What do you think you'll be doing in 10 years? And even at that point, I just said, I wanted a really cool job in sports. You know, that was my five years. What are you going to be doing in 10 years? Hopefully a really cool job in sports. 15 years, same thing. I just always wanted to combine my 
my passion for sports with my life and my career. And, and again, now girls have a choice. If they're talented enough, they might be able to make a significant living, hopefully continuing to grow and have that living be commensurate with their talent. But um, they have those opportunities much more broadly now, but they also have the opportunity to combine their love and passion and, and commitment to sports in a professional career. So I have worked in sports my whole career and um, with a couple little forays at Chelsea Piers where they dragged me into some business that was not sports related, but that I learned a tremendous amount from but yeah I mean I, I just always wanted to, to work in sports and it's a great honor to be able to have um, done that for my, my whole career. Well I can't thank you both enough for for taking the time that hour flew by that might have been the fastest hour of uh, of my life but uh, you were both so great to, to at such great insight. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that this recording will be available if you want to come back and watch again or though for those who want to watch later. Um, also want to thank Kim and Anna for their help behind the scenes um, back at the library. And uh, anything you, you'd each like to add before we end it up? I think you're probably both all talked out. No, so. well, just thanks for thanks very much. It was an honor to be on with Molly. And uh, again, I know she's going to lift the uh, LPGA to even greater heights. And I want to just thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about a law that's means, meant so much to both of us. I mean, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today if this transformational law uh, hadn't made my educational journey and everything that flowed from that possible. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, you know, to share a few perspectives on how that unfolded for us. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. And, and just really, um, in addition to the gratitude and thanks, but just going forward, you know, continue to get to know the female athletes and continue to support um, both at the, at the high, you know, youth level, at the high school level, at the college level, at the professional level. I don't think anyone will be disappointed with um, getting to know these remarkable women who are performing at the highest level and continuing to give opportunity, um, you know, not just for for young girls whose families can afford it, but young girls and young boys whose families can't. I think that's the next big um, frontier that we really need to cross is how do we make sure that we sort of continue to democratize sports? Because right now it's moving a little bit in the wrong direction just in terms of the pay for play. So I think it just takes a takes a whole community to, to realize that and to think through how important sports are for people's growth and development. So love these conversations. Anywhere where Val's gonna be on, I, I say yes to. So um, appreciate being on with her, learn from her every time that I'm around her. So really uh, gra glad to be here. And uh, I wanna give a big shout out to my friend, Kim Mazaros, who's on the call, who is my unbelievable friend and, and partner at Princeton. So that's a, a huge pleasure to have her on this call too. Well, thanks again to both of you. Keep doing the great work that you're doing. And uh, thanks for those who joined us. And remember, we have some more programs down the line everybody can tune into. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks.